After shaders, attributes are probably the single most important part of WebGL, so giving attributes the attention they deserve in this series is going to take more than one video. Here, we're going to look at some of the basics of attributes. We'll see some of the things that are new in WebGL 2. We'll look at attribute locations, including two syntax options that I recommend that you try out, including one that's new to WebGL 2. And we'll redo one of our previous applications to use attributes instead of the uniforms and multiple draw calls. In previous videos, we had to limit ourselves to point primitives. The only way we could draw two items on the screen, two points, was by doing two separate draw calls. Three points would have required three draw calls. And without uh, attributes, that's all you can do. You can't draw lines, you can't draw triangles, you can't draw complex 3D objects. You basically can't do anything interesting. Attributes change that. They make it possible to draw multiple vertices from data stored in array buffers. They are designed to be quick and efficient. With one vertex, you can draw a point with two, a line with three, a triangle. With dozens or hundreds, you can draw a sophisticated 3D object. In mathematics, a vertex is a single point composed of just enough information to set its location in 2D or 3D or 100D space. In computer graphics and WebGL, this definition is expanded to include any number of other factors, which we call attributes. For us, a vertex will almost always contain some spatial coordinates, that is, position data, like X and Y, but it can contain other information like an RGB color, an alpha transparency value, a texture coordinate, a normal, a matrix transform, basically any float or anything composed of floats, like vectors and matrices. They're different from uniforms in two main ways. Uniforms can be used in both our vertex shaders and fragment shaders, and uniforms remain constant during a draw call. But attributes will only appear in our vertex shaders, and during a single draw call, their value will change over and over, once for every vertex we feed it. In WebGL 1, we used to declare attributes in our vertex shaders like this top example. But in WebGL 2, the shading language has been updated, so this syntax no longer compiles. As far as what you need to know, the type qualifier attribute is gone. In its place, we now have the storage qualifier in. And long story short, rewrite your vertex shader to use in instead of attribute, and you're good to go. While we're here, the type qualifier varying is also gone. Instead, you can forward values from your vertex shader using the out qualifier and receive them in your fragment shader using the in qualifier. Now, just saying this sentence out loud makes me feel confused all over again, but I think that the concept is incredibly intuitive, probably even easier than it used to be. In your vertex shader, attributes come in from JavaScript, and varings go out to your fragment shader. And in your fragment shader, varings come in, and the resulting color information goes out to the frame buffer and the canvas. The number of attributes that you can declare in a vertex shader is limited. As a developer, you are guaranteed a minimum of 16 attributes per WebGL program. This limit varies from device to device. My 8-year-old Mac allows uh, 16, while my bargain bin Android supports 32. You can look up this value at runtime using the function that you see here. Just remember that some devices may be unable to view your application if you declare more attributes than they can support. The number of vertices that you can have in a single draw call is also limited, but not by much. In theory, you should be able to have over 65,000 vertices, but it's pretty unlikely that you'll ever use so many. Now let's talk about attribute locations. Just like we talked about in our video on uniforms, attribute locations are just numbers. They connect your JavaScript to the parts of your shaders that change. Instead of constantly talking to your GPU about some attribute called A underscore color or A underscore normal, you talk to it about attribute number two or attribute number one. Getting this value is just like with uniforms. You just call get attribute location with the name of the attribute that you're after. You only need to do this once. After you've compiled your shaders and linked them to your program, these location values won't change. So if you need these values later, it's best to hang on to them in your JavaScript. Unlike with uniforms, WebGL also gives us other ways to deal with attribute locations, arguably easier ways. 
First, rather than asking your program what location number it's chosen, you can tell it what value to use using bind attrib location. But this can only be done before linking your shaders. And if you're using GLSL 3ES, the new version of WebGL shading language, you can also set the attrib location statically in your shader code using the layout qualifier and a location value. Whichever method you choose, you'll find doing this makes it easier to share your shaders and attributes across programs. Feel free to use either version. Many WebGL developers seem to prefer the first form, probably because it's been available since WebGL 1, and the second one seems to be the preferred way for OpenGL developers, probably because it's been around for much longer for them. Okay, so that was a lot of talking. Let's try this out. In our last video, we used uniforms and two draw calls to paint two point primitives to the canvas. Let's try this again, but with attributes and a single draw call. We're going right back to our Hello World example from our earlier video on the minimal WebGL program. Let's just review what's going on here. Here's the canvas with its big red square dot. This is being done in a single draw call. We're painting a point primitive once. Everything in the vertex shader is static. We're hard coding our point to the center of the canvas with a width and a height of 150 pixels. Our fragment shader is static too. We're writing the color red to every pixel of the point. First thing to notice about our shaders is that we're using version 3 ES of WebGL shading language. You can ignore this pragma statement. This is just for me. It turns on simple error checking in my shader strings. This wall of code simply makes a WebGL program that runs on the GPU. And our new code is going to slip in here. What I like to do is use my uniforms and attributes before I define them. So we're going to need to define one float attribute called a point size. And just for demonstration, why don't we pass in just the x and y values for the position as a vec2. We'll call it a position. Let's define our attributes using the in storage qualifier. Okay, we didn't get any errors, so the code seems to be okay. Now let's write our JavaScript, first by finding the locations of our two new attributes. And we can see here that we're getting back two numbers. I want to point out here that if you get back a minus 1 for an attribute location or a null for a uniform location, it could mean a typo. But you'll also see this if you don't actually use your attribute or uniform in your shader. You can see here that we're still declaring a point size, but we've removed the variable from our code. And we get minus 1 again, almost like it was a typo. This is just something to be aware of. Once you've found your locations, you have to enable them using Enable Vertex Attrib Array. This should be done only once, typically after binding to a buffer, but in this case we can actually get away with it here. Okay, let's start thinking about our data. We're going to need a buffer to, uh, to hold it, and bind that buffer to uh, uh, a target. Okay, so I think it's actually a bit too early to start talking about binding and buffers and targets just yet. I'll probably do another video on this soon, but for now, let's just bind to the array buffer target and move on. Next, we set our data using the same array buffer target. And now we basically have two options. We can specify the size of our data in bytes and set our data separately. OpenGL programmers prefer to do this, I think. But we'll be sending in our data directly. And this data won't be changing, so we can specify static draw. Now, buffer data doesn't exist yet, so let's make that next. We're using floats, so let's create a float32 array. And let's put our first vertex at the center of the canvas and make it 100 pixels in size. 
Most of this seems pretty easy, if a bit boring, but here's the first actual tricky part. In our shader code, attributes will always be simple floats, or things made of floats, like vex and matrices. But our JavaScript data is going to be a mishmash, usually interleaving different data types, including even 8 and 16-bit integers. We use vertex attrib pointer to tell WebGL how to unravel our array buffer data into the values and data types that our shader expects and needs. Let's start with our position attribute. First, we specify the location, then the size. This x and y, they're two numbers, so the size is two. They're floats. The normalized argument is false. The stride is the number of bytes in each set of our vertex data. There's three floats, and a float contains four bytes. Since this is the first attribute of the set, the offset is zero. Now the point size. It's not a VEC2 or a VEC3, it's a simple float, so the size is one. We're skipping over the two position values, so the offset will be two, times the number of bytes in a float. And everything works. Let's draw three boxes. Brilliant. Three boxes with a single draw call. Now let's get colors into our fragment shader. Let's just do RGB. As I said before, fragment shaders don't receive attributes, so we're going to have to use a varying. I'll call it uh, V color. It's coming in from the fragment shader. RGB, so a VEC3. Obviously, it has to go out from the vertex shader. We have to give it the same name, and this value has to come from somewhere, so we'll add a new attribute called a color. And copy the value of our attribute to the variant. And it works. Note that we're not actually sending any new data in, so WebGL assumes everything is zero. It's black. So next we have to update our data and vertex attrib pointers. Add red, green, and blue. Before our stride was set for three floats, but now we have six floats. Our point size attribute is still two bytes from the start of the data set, so that's unchanged. We'll need a new location and enable it, and add a new attrib pointer. Three floats in a VEC3, and it's three floats in from the start of the data set. Success. But we're not done yet. Let's try setting the attribute locations rather than asking WebGL where it's decided to put them. Just for reference, let's look up what the values are now and make sure that we change these up a little bit. So 0, 1, and 2 are position, color, and point size. Let's set the position to 0, point size to 1, and color to 2. And set these locations manually using bind attribute location. And that didn't work, but that's because you have to set location values before you link up your program. So let's just move the code up here. And it works again. That's nice. Now let's not bother with reading or setting our location values in JavaScript. Remember that in GLSL 3 we can specify these values in our vertex shader. We do that with the layout qualifier like this. Remember we decided position was 0, point size is 1, and color is 2. 
and it still works. So I hope that you use this new knowledge and go forward to draw lots and lots of points. Okay, okay, so now we have three vertices, which means that we're free to make a whole bunch of other primitives, not just points. Let's change our vertex positions a bit to make things look uh, cleaner. The centers of our three points are now on the edge of the canvas. If we try to draw with lines, well, without a fourth point or a third point, we'll just get ignored. But we can use line strip, which connects any number of vertices with lines. Or we can use line loop, which will connect the last vertex with the first. Or we can use triangles. Notice that the colors at the three points of the triangle, the three vertices, match the colors of the original three points with our point primitives. What we have here is the real foundation of almost everything that you'll ever do in WebGL. There's a lot more to say about attributes and some of the optimizations that have been added in WebGL 2, but this is going to have to wait for a future video.